Hello, welcome everyone. So today I'm going to tell you why junior developers are awesome and uh, why it actually makes a lot of sense to hire juniors. So why should you listen to anything that I have to say? Uh, I am an alumni of uh, the Ruby on Rails class from Portland Code School. I'm currently taking the JavaScript class there and I'm also, when I want to get paid, the assistant director there. Um, so I am a junior developer and I help junior developers get hired and I see on an everyday basis the kinds of talent and expertise that they learn and uh, how they're much more capable in some ways and much less than others sometimes. But um, I'm intimately familiar with the capabilities and limitations of junior developers. So I think you should hire junior developers because it leads to sustainable hiring within your organization, to creating more intentional processes, to reducing the technical debt of your organization, and to better allocating your resources as an, as an organization. So when I say junior developer, I, very, I asked a lot of people on Twitter to contribute what they thought uh, a junior developer was. And this is one of the responses that I got. And I was very grateful to these people for uh, contributing their thoughts. But I wanted to uh, show this as an example of what I am not talking about. If this is your definition of a junior developer, you are not who I am talking to. Um, this person, in my opinion, is closer to a mid-level developer, if you already know four or five languages and have an intimate knowledge of all of these different things. So when I'm talking about junior developers, what I'm talking about is somebody who has a solid foundation in at least one programming language with a handle on basic algorithms and data structures. Reasonable expectation for a junior. Somebody with little or no wor real world experience. Less than five professional projects in the wild. Someone who may be a recent graduate of college or a code school, maybe self-taught, uh, but that has a good uh, ability to work with a team and to solve problems. So I think a lot of us are familiar with uh, how fraught the hiring in technology can be currently. So this is from a report on undergraduate STEM education by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And it says that if the United States is to maintain its historic preeminence in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and gain the social, economic, and national security benefits that come with such preeminence, it must produce approximately one million more STEM professionals over the next decade than are projected to graduate at the current rates. And to meet this goal, the United States will need to increase the number of students who receive undergraduate STEM degrees by about 34% annually. I don't know if you think that that's possible, but I think that's kind of a stretch goal. <laughs> In Oregon, uh, we're projected to add 2,500 jobs just in software publishing in the next 10 years. That's 27% growth in the industry in the next decade. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen that many junior, or that many seniors just magically appearing out of the ether. So the only way to fill these kind of gaps is to hire people who aren't seniors. We have this idea of common wisdom about what is needed to hire a junior. Um, uh, people say things that, like, we can't spare the resources, we can't spare senior resources for mentoring. We, our documentation is bad, our process is bad. Juniors don't provide value for a long period of time, and so our, it's more of an investment. It would be an altruistic thing for us to do to hire juniors. They have this idea of an ideal scenario for hiring juniors where you have a dedicated mentor who can give all this time, you have rock solid documentation, 100% test coverage, battle tested onboarding, all the money. Anybody work at that place? <laughs> Any, seriously, anybody? Because I don't and it'd be awesome, but this isn't reality. So it's probably, probably never going to be like that. Um, and not everybody wants that. Not everybody is looking for an organization where that's the case. We need to recognize that juniors come from different walks of life and have different needs, just like your seniors are special snowflakes. Juniors are too. And all of them are going to have different things that they value in organizations. 
So you may find juniors who actually have decades of experience in a previous industry that's applicable to your specific use case as an organization. You may find people who are younger and who are more flexible in their requirements and the hours that they want to work in the situation where that they want to work in. Um, and they may be able to have a lot of different values that uh, your organization needs that you wouldn't expect. So the essentials, in my opinion, for hiring juniors are to understand where you are as an organization and how that's going to affect, woo, I'm a little too close apparently, how that will affect ramp up time and to make sure that you get consent from everybody involved in that transaction. So the key is not to create an ideal scenario, but to find the ideal candidate within the junior pool who fits the use case of your organization. And then to make sure that they understand where you're coming from. So I want to be clear that I don't think you should hire people because of altruism. It's true that there is a lot of room within tech, uh, a lot of empty positions that are difficult to fill, but that's not really a reason to hire someone. You shouldn't hire someone just because it will make the industry better as a whole. That doesn't make a lot of business sense. Um, this, the story with this goes that uh, you, know, you should hire them for the good of the, industry, the tech industry, but this sets up some bad assumptions, um, including what I talked about earlier, that juniors don't actually provide value to their organization. Um, I actually think that that's a miscalibration of the word value, and we'll talk a little bit about that more later. So also as, as a side note, um, as a member of several underrepresented groups in tech, this narrative is something that I'm kind of familiar with, that you should hire for diversity because it's the right thing to do. And that's, that's great, and I think that we should have diversity, but um, that's, not really, that's not really a good business decision, right, to just like hire because. Um, so I want to talk about some measurable ways that it's actually valuable to your organization. Um, to, to hire these people. So let's start with the biggest one, the math. One of the, biggest, uh, one of the biggest objections to hiring juniors is senior time and how much it's going to cost to hire a junior. So it's difficult to quantify these things, but we're gonna try and use some generic numbers and come to an understanding of what it really means, dollars and cents wise, to hire a junior. So a typical, the median salary for a junior developer is $57,500 a year. The median for a senior is $107,850. So the common wisdom kind of says that, well, juniors, you know, you're gonna have four to six months ramp up time. Their time plus 30 to 50% of a senior's time is this huge amount of money and you hire a senior and they're just gonna start spitting money out for your organization on day one, right? <laughs> that this is the way that it works. You hire a senior and then just money flow, falls from the sky and it's wonderful, the clouds part. We, we all know that's not true, right? There's always ramp up time, even for seniors. So what do the numbers really look like? So in the first year of hiring, this is what I project the cost will be. So if you have a, rec a recruiter finding you candidates at 20 to 30%, this is how much you're gonna pay for a junior versus a senior. For the interviewing, um, th this is some assumptions that I found from a, a recruiter online who was talking about this, that you'll have you know, resume screenings, six minutes per resume, 100 resumes, phone screenings, 30 minutes per call at 10 calls, um, you know, in-person interviews for five candidates, 60 minutes each, that actually sounds a little low to me, especially for senior candidates. Um, most, most companies in tech that I know will do some sort of half day on-site interview or a contract, a contract project, something like that. So that even adds additional cost to that baseline, especially for senior candidates. You also have to look at the first year's worth of salary. Now these salaries are uh, the median salary plus the additional expense of a mentor for both of those positions. And then you come out with the total first year cost. And as you can see, that's, that's a pretty high number for a junior, 95,000, that's a lot of money. But when you compare it to the seniors, well, that's, that's actually more reasonable, I think, when you think of it in that context. So what we're really looking at is um, on total onboarding costs in this range. So 38 to 60,000 for a junior, 43 to 61 for a senior. Uh, so we can see that 
juniors are cheaper, but we're really looking on, for return on investment. So how much value are we going to get and how do we figure that? So a big component of that is going to be turnover. Obviously, if you're having to go through this hiring process over and over in a very short cycle, it's going to ramp up the amount of money that it costs to hire and maintain a worker. So assuming you can maintain a junior or a senior over four years, this is how their average cost changes over time, including a cost of living adjustment of $2,500 per year for a junior and $5,500 for a senior. Uh, that's about 5% for a senior. Uh, for the junior, I found uh, what the, I assume they'll probably be up to mid-developer standard by three or four years. So I found the median salary for a mid-level developer, subtracted it, divided it over these years. So that's where those numbers are coming from, if you're curious. So what you can see is that you're, you're, uh, your costs actually dramatically decrease for, for juniors over time, right? And looking at it over the course of just a couple of years, it's much more reasonable to expect an employee to cost seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year than it is for them to cost one hundred and seventeen at the junior level. So, really, what this means is that you have to treat your employees right, right? So, the better you treat your employees, the more fulfilled that they are at your organization, the longer they're going to stay, and the better your return on investment. So this comes back to this idea of what does value mean? So juniors can reduce technical debt at your organization, um, and that is, is a value in and of itself. We have this idea that shipping code is the only value that a developer provides, but that's not really true. So juniors are really your process team for the first six months or so that you hire them. Anything confusing about your code, about your documentation, any lack of tests, they're gonna run face first into it, right? And so then you're going to be able to identify all of the pain points that anyone who tries to use your API is going to feel, all of your users are going to see. Anything that's confusing is going to be, you know, is going to be something that then has to be dealt with at that point. And I think that sometimes the, the frustration with juniors can come from this place. It's very frustrating to deal with all of these little nitpicky little problems that you know, somebody who's more experienced would be able to jump right over. But the reality is that it's, it's valuable to do this. So it's, it's useful to kind of examine that frustration when you do feel it with a junior and see if that's coming from a place of being frustrated with them for not being smart enough or not knowing something, or if it's actually frustration with the fact that you have technical debt that you're now being forced to deal with. It's also useful to say, to tell your juniors to then deal with that problem. If they have a problem and they come to you with it, then you can say, you know, refactor this code, make it less confusing, write better documentation, fix more tests. Even if you only have them do it as an exercise and whatever they come back with is horrible and you scrap it, at that point, your team is then having a conversation about that point of pain. So it may be that you don't use the code that they write or the documentation that they write, but then your team can come together and be forced to deal with that problem. This also uh, extends to the cultural part of your organization as well. So diversity has been scientifically proven to have positive effects on the bottom line of a company. I'm not really a fan of having to look at the dollars and cents of, and quantify people that way, but it, does, it is a consideration for business. So I wanna make sure that we, we talk about that as well. So when you think of diversity in tech, a lot of times we're talking about women, we're talking about gender, maybe you're thinking of people of color in that mix, um, but the diversity narrative is, is pretty uh, one dimensional in a lot of ways. And you need to think about having people with diverse skill sets as part of that diversity component in your organization. And the more diverse uh, viewpoints that you have within your organization, the better able you are to, uh, to react when something goes wrong, to create solid products that are going to meet the needs of all of your users. Sorry, everybody. Yikes, that was scary. Our technical, our sound guy's gone too, huh? Sorry about that. All right, well, getting back to it. Um, you also wanna think about the component of who is tasked with fixing things. So if you have some fiddly little CSS bug that is irritating to your users, but 
kind of intermittent. Maybe it's not, a, it's never going to be a high priority task, right? It's going to sink to the bottom and maybe never get dealt with. If you have juniors, those things can be fixed in a cost effective way. Now, you want to be careful there that you're not only ever giving your juniors low hanging fruit, never giving them something interesting or complicated because you want to go back to that turnover piece, right? You don't want them to burn out and leave your organization and then it won't be as good of an investment for you. Um, but at the same time, there's a, a little bit of, of uh, expectation that you will have to have some crappy things to do sometimes as a junior, and that's okay. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. I think if I breathe on it, it doesn't like it. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll just ignore the microphone. Then. Get rid of this. Oh, this is recording me? Okay. All right. Never mind then. Okay. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Um, so these are from that data sheet that I talked about earlier that I kind of pulled some people, got some information about juniors within their organization. So one of the things that people were saying is that our team's not large enough to spare the bandwidth to mentor and train juniors. So what's, uh, what's, what are some ways that we can deal with this? So th the important thing, like I said earlier, is to understand uh, what your capacity is as an organization. It's okay to not have enough time to dedicate to a junior. It's okay to admit that as an organization. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you really just need a senior candidate. But at the same time, be, care be careful that you're evaluating that in a way that's realistic. If you don't uh, make it a priority, then it, it never gets to the top, right? So you want to evaluate what resources you have and really commit to giving what you can and then communicate that information to the people during your hiring process so that you're bringing juniors in and you can tell them, I only have five hours a week to dedicate to X, Y, or Z. I only have three hours a week that we can dedicate to mentoring you to doing one-on-one -on -one time. And make sure that the person that you're hiring is going to be able to be successful in that environment. Um, and, and a lot of this just comes back to being an adult and communicating well and getting consent from people. Making sure that they understand where you are, you understand where you are as an organization and, and the effect that it's going to have. If you only have three hours a week to dedicate to your juniors, don't expect them to ramp up in two months. It's not going to happen. Um, but if you're okay with people having a little bit of a longer lead time, maybe taking six, eight months a year to get to full capacity, then this is a great way to get started on that. So another case study. So it's important that every team member provide high value as soon as possible. And again, we're going back to this idea of technical debt. Um, you know, you, you have to remember that value comes not just from shipping features, from shipping code. Also, you want to make sure that your organization is sustainable. Um, and juniors are like cats. I, this is a little strange, I know, but it helps people remember it, I think. Uh, I have fostered a lot of cats, and they tend to do better in pairs. If you get two of them, then they entertain each other. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of how it works. If you have one cat, they get bored and they go running around in your source code and break things, right? So, <laughs> so if you hire two juniors, then they can pair. And then at that point, when they do come to you with problems, it's things that neither of them had the skills to deal with, that neither of them had the skills to find the answers to. So it's going to increase the, uh, the level of their ability to uh, produce for you and to accomplish things. So let's review why you should hire juniors. So they are a cheaper alternative in the long run, even when you include the mentoring time with seniors. They're actually more valuable in some of the process areas uh, and they can bring a diversity of experience and additional uh, workplace career things in from uh, non-traditional backgrounds. They're also a much more available, hireable resource. They're a way, there are always juniors looking for jobs. That's not always the case with seniors. And this whole game of poaching people off of each other isn't going to last forever. So how to hire juniors. The key here is to communicate 
to make sure that they have some sort of resource to fall back on, even if that's just another junior. Uh, and also to make sure that you're calibrating the resource dedicated to the speed of onboarding. Like I said, that component of if you only have three hours to give, maybe it takes them eight months to ramp up and being okay with that. And just making sure that everybody has a clear agreement and measurable goals along the way to make sure that your, your expectations meet their expectations and that you're able to uh, come together and recalibrate if those expectations fall, fall through at any point. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, at this point, I actually have um, one very small shameless plug. So I, I do work at Portland Code School. So if you're actively hiring juniors, if you would like to know about new juniors when they graduate in the future, or if you're interested in teaching, please come talk to me afterward. I have a whole bunch of Node and Ruby and JavaScript and front-end people who are looking for work. So if your organization could be benefited, please come talk to me. Um, so some attribution, thank you for my little uh, tweet guy from the Noun Project and to Open Source Bridge for letting me steal their logo for my slide theme. And I do have the references that I used for some of these numbers and for some of this data available in my slides if you would like it later, which will be in the session notes in just a little bit. And then some additional resources. Uh, I would like to put some more things here because I do have more resources, but I just didn't get them on the slide in time. So those will also be included in the session notes if you're interested. All right. Any questions? You can clap too. <laughs> I do. Um, I was actually having a conversation with someone last night. Um, the median salary, as you saw, was 57000 uh, I had someone say to me last night, I want to hire my juniors in a range that's promotable. If they're going to make, if you know within five years they're going to make that $100,000 range, make sure that you're hiring them at a rate that makes sense that you can get them there at that point. Because if they know that they can jump 20% in salary, it is possible that they will leave your organization. Um, there is also the component of it too. I don't think you should exploit people, but at the same time, if you're giving people their first opportunity and you're treating them well, there's a component of loyalty that comes into it. And there's also a component of, um, I, I was trying to find data on this, right? right? So to see how often people leave based on their experience level. And the closest I could find was data on uh, people who are from underrepresented groups, so people of color, women, people like that. Um, and I think that it actually makes sense as a corollary because the uh, key aspect there is power difference, right? And people from underrepresented groups do tend to leave at a much lower rate than people uh, who are not from underrepresented groups. And I think that that probably can be extrapolated to juniors as well. I'm still actively looking for data on that. So if I find more, I'll add, them to, I'll add it to these slides at some point. And if anyone has data on that, let me know. Um, but that's, that's the best that I have right now. <laughs> And that goes back to, here I'm going to go back to this turnover slide because I think it's useful. So if your junior stays four years, you're only paying on average $70,000 a year for them. Uh, if your senior leaves after two, you're paying $130,000 to $140,000 a year for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas the seniors, a lot of seniors will complain locally too, but for a totally different reason. Seniors complain because if they are not what they're used to, 
There's also a component here of uh, continuing education for your entire team. Uh, so bringing on a junior is going to force all of your senior people to start thinking from that perspective as well, uh, which is a valuable thing. And I, I don't suggest that you um, just throw a junior at somebody who's never mentored before and say, you'll learn together without some sort of oversight in that process. It, it can be useful, but Again, it's one of those things that, remember, it's going to, the resources you allocate are going to produce a certain outcome. So if that's what you have right now and that's where you're going to start, just make sure everybody's on board with that and that, that there's a, a mechanism for people to give feedback about that that's safe. So if you just assign somebody to a mentor and then tell them to go with God, uh, that's not really great because then if there is any problems with their mentor then they don't really have recourse so just make sure there's a chain of command there's ways to short circuit problems when they happen yes i haven't done a lot of research around that at this point uh, but that's a great idea for a next talk <laughs> so. anything else Do you have any resources, Emily, for mentoring? No? OK. Um, it's something that I think that our current company and my last company really struggled with, and that I've made with closing some of those lines. But um, it's really difficult to get into implementation because it requires, it does require some non-trivial amount of resources. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear about stuff too. I think that the key there is going to be documenting your process um, and continuing to advocate for yourself. Uh, this is, this is a, a good example, right? You should look first inside your own organization. Your Q&A people and your support people and your admin people may be totally awesome developers if you gave them a chance. Um, there's opportunities to, uh, you know, spend a little bit of money getting people some additional education, especially with some, some of the places like, you know, the community colleges that we have in the area, the code schools that we have in the area. It's not that expensive to retrain somebody to be able to have some technical skills. So definitely, you know, look within before you go outside because it's, there's a lot of people languishing who end up leaving because uh, that's what happened with me, actually. My, previous organization, I went to them and said, I really want to go to this code school. I want to be a developer. If you'll, you'll, you already pay for college for other people. If you'll pay for me to do this, it was only $3,500. And you know, give me some time to dedicate to it, then I'll move into development and you can keep me on contract for however long to pay off the, the benefit that you've given me. And they told me no. Uh, and so I ended up leaving the organization as a result once I, once I graduated from this program. So um, there's an aspect of turnover that doesn't have to do with developers, and remember that as well. <laughs> yes? Finding, I'm sorry? Who are looking for work? Um, there are other code schools in, the in town as well. Uh, yes? 
I would highly recommend uh, if you are looking for genius, looking at your job postings yes. carefully because they're out there and they'll apply for your job if you make it at all reasonable to make a new set. Yes. It's been a very long day. <laughs> <laughs> the men's will apply if it's 60%, and if it's a woman or a person of color, so like demographic, they, they have to be mm -hmm. at 100%. So making sure you're careful that you don't list all of the bells and whistles you hope you get, because you can turn away from your desk that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't require a CS degree unless you really want to require a CS degree. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hard problem, right? I'm not saying that this is an easy thing to do. Um, it's challenging to evaluate someone's technical skills, but I think that's true at any level. Uh, and there's always risk for anybody, anytime you hire somebody. Um, yeah, but I, I think that the, the job, uh, the job posting piece of it is really important. I see this especially in the Ruby community, and it's actually one of the key reasons that Portland Code School has moved away from teaching a Ruby class is that our graduates were getting hired, but they were all getting hired in these weird backdoor, back alley transactions because no one would actually say they were hiring juniors. Everyone would tell you, no, no, we never hire juniors, only seniors, only experienced people, at least five years experience. But then they would hire three juniors this year. And you're, you would look at them and say, well, what, why? And they would say, oh, well, they knew such and such who said that they were cool. Well, that's not really a good metric <laughs> for evaluating people. <laughs> like, they were fun at a meetup is not necessarily a good metric. Um, and, and that's hackable, right? Like, at my school, we teach people to do that. We tell them to go to meetups. It is part of our curriculum that they go and they talk to people because we know that that's how they get hired. And it's unfortunate because we can't just send them to all of these postings that exist for juniors. They get hired, but they have to do this weird song and dance to try and convince people that it's worth the risk. So. I think that that can be useful for some organizations, but it comes with its own set of, uh, of cons. So if you're hiring somebody who's a junior for maybe their first contract work, maybe one of their first few contract jobs, if it's not long enough, then they're always looking for the door because they don't have the cushion yet, probably. If they're, especially like for me, I was coming from an industry where I was getting paid $10 an hour. I had no cushion. I could not afford to spend it one day with not working. So if you gave me a two month contract, I was still applying for jobs that entire time and couldn't really focus on your organization because I was so concerned about making sure that my family had somewhere, you know, had safety before I could dedicate resources to you know, being loyal at a job. So just make sure that if you are doing contract work, there's enough of a, a time period for people to really focus, at least for a period of time, and that you're giving them clear feedback along the way so that they're not terrified that you're gonna fire them at any moment. Um, make it clear from the beginning, we expect you to get to this point regardless of your, you know, regardless of your output. If they completely suck, promise them three months at least. It's not that expensive to promise three months to a junior. Um, you know, it's much better if you can say six month contract, we'll reevaluate at five months to see you know, where you are. Because at that point you're able to say yes or no, and then I'll either extend their contract, bring them on as a full-time employee, or you know, tell them that it's time to start looking again. Anything else? No? All right. Thank you, everybody.